Welcome to this Geekscape special. I'm your host, Christian Blatt, joined from New York by John Pett. John, say hello to the people. Hello. Sometimes that doesn't work when you do it. With us today is Kenneth Johnson, who uh, likes to be called Kenny. Kenny Johnson, who is a producer, writer, director. His credits include The Incredible Hulk, The Bionic Woman, and Short Circuit 2. But today, we're going to focus on his work as writer-director of the miniseries V, which turns 40 years old this year. <laughs> Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. How is that possible? I don't. I must have been a child when I did it. You know. Well, the interesting uh, thing is, both... I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's a. Uh, it it uh, V was is probably my legacy piece. It's certainly the uh, the piece of work that I am the proudest of uh, of all of my work. Uh, I think primarily because it all came out of my little pea brain, and it wasn't an, an adaptation of something else like uh, the Incredible Hulk or Alien Nation and, and that sort of thing. Um, and, um, and it's a, uh, it's remarkable how it has just hung on and been so popular for so long. It's thrilling. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting thing to think about because, you know, when you think about how it's been 40 years, uh, since it aired, uh, that makes me, uh, I was seven when it aired and I have a seven-year-old son now. And uh, uh, he he's certainly uh, not ready for it. But at the same time, uh, my parents didn't feel I was ready for it at that time. So right. it took a little while for me to catch up. What I knew about the, the original uh, miniseries is from uh, this uh, wonderful book that uh, AC Crispin did uh, that has the first half of it is uh, the original miniseries. And, uh, you know, we were we were kids. And it's interesting because as as you watch it as an adult, you're like, oh, wow, this is such a more advanced story than it seems like when you're a kid, but especially your original miniseries. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm not just saying this because you're here. It's on a completely different level than everything that followed. And, you know, a, a lot of stuff followed. Uh, and, and you know, I, I I have tons of stuff here. I mean, I've, I've even got a stack of the V comic book here, you know, so <laughs> there's, there's no shortage of uh, examples. But I'm interested, you talked about your pea brain, your words, not mine. Uh, <laughs> talk about how the idea first comes to you for this story. Well, I, I, uh, I think it's pretty well known that I had, uh, I was a fan of the uh, American writer Sinclair Lewis. I'd read a lot of his work like Main Street and uh, uh, Aerosmith and Elmer Gantry and others. And in 1935, uh, he wrote a, a book that was not quite as famous as those became, uh, but I stumbled across it, having gone through his other uh, oeuvre, as it were, and and I was intrigued because it was a, wrote, a book he wrote in 1935 about the rise of fascism happening then in Italy and uh, and Germany, and about how well can't happen here because this is America, you know, and I and I was intrigued by the idea of uh, of America uh, and all all of us who live here um, undergoing a, a really sort of sea change in our life. Uh, and we hadn't experienced anything like that since before I was born and Pearl Harbor was attacked in 1941, uh, where suddenly overnight we were in a different world, you know? And um, uh, and so I was curious about how people would react to that if, uh, and I wrote a, an original screenplay uh, was based on a rise of fascism happening in the United States uh, in this day and age. Uh, hard to believe, isn't it? And um, uh, and I um, uh, and I wrote a script. There were no aliens. There were no spacecraft and that sort of thing in it. It was uh, it was really a very serious, dramatic piece about how a grassroots sort of uh, bubbling suddenly percolates up, and ov overnight we're in a in a different country. Um, and uh, uh, and I was having dinner with Brandon Tartikoff, who was my friend and then the president of NBC. Um, and um, we worked together uh, previously when he was a vice president uh, at ABC, I guess is where our initial contacts came. But uh, we, we got to be good friends on a number of shows. And, and he asked me what I was interested in right at that particular moment. And I told him about the script that I had, uh, had written. And, um, uh, and he said, well, I really I want to read it. And I said, no, no, this is a, like for a feature. It's like a big feature, Brandon. He said, let me, let me read it. I just want to read it. So he read it and he loved it. And, uh, and he said, listen, why don't we make it into a big mini series? And I said, okay, that's, I'd like to do that. Uh, I'm a director and that's the only reason I write is so that I have something to direct. Uh, Chris Nolan said that uh, recently, that's about, you know, how, why he started writing because nobody would give him anything to direct, you know? 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, believe Qu- I, I believe Quentin Tarantino did the same thing. You know, yes, and, it's, uh, and it's Kevin a, Smith. It's a, yeah, it's a catch twenty two problem. You yeah. know, how do you how do you get a directing gig when you haven't had a directing gig? Well, as soon as you've had one, then come back. You know, so uh, and fortunately, I was able to hire myself uh, at one point, and that made it a lot easier. But uh, but I, you know, I, I uh, uh, Brandon wanted to do it, but he was afraid that Americans wouldn't get fascism. And I said, well, you know, it's not that complicated, Brandon. You know, you put on a black shirt and you shave your head and you beat somebody up. Uh, and, and he suggested this, this then Soviets or the Chinese might be the, uh, uh, inter, uh, the occupying force. And I just didn't buy it. And, and his young vice president, um, uh, Harvard MBA grad uh, business major, Jeff Sagansky, uh, said, how about aliens, Kenny? And I just I just clutched because you know I had a I had a I had a very classic theatrical education at Carnegie what's now Carnegie Mellon University uh, in in the classics from the Greeks and the Romans all the way through Shakespeare to Strindberg you know to the contemporaries uh, and I you know, thought of myself as being a, somebody that wanted to do that kind of work but the problem arises when you break in in a big way and become known for something like the bionic woman uh, that I created and uh, which then leads into the Incredible Hulk and what happens in Hollywood is the pigeonhole begins to get smaller and smaller you know and I uh, and I just didn't want to become known as the sort of the sci-fi guy and uh, and so when when Jeff suggested uh, you know uh, 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 visiting um, uh, extraterrestrial <laughs> And Brandon, Brandon said, oh, well, just, just think about it. Just, no, 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 we're not pressing. Just, you know, because we really want to do something with you. Yada, yada. And so I went home that night and I sat there and I thought, it's really a brilliant idea that Jeff had. Uh, because I can do the story that I want to do, which is a story about how people respond to power. That's what V is about. It's about power. It's about an uber power rolling in over top of us like the Nazis did over Europe in World War II and how people, different individual people react to that. Um, and how some will, will collaborate like the Vichy French uh, sucking up to the Nazis and others will sort of be, go along to get along and keep their heads down. And, um, and still others will be the ones that say, no, 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 this power is being abused. We have to fight back against it. And they become the heroes of the resistance. And, uh, uh, and that idea really, really appealed to me. And that's really what my initial screenplay had been about. Um, but I realized I could still tell all of that sort of story about how individuals react to that kind of power, but I would have all the eye candy and the razzle dazzle that would attract the seven and eight and 10 and 12 year olds, uh, and the younger people in the audience, uh, but also, uh, uh, allow me to tell the same story that I wanted to tell about power. Um, and so uh, I went back into Brandon and I said, okay, I think we can do it if we do it this, this way. And I said, that's great, that's great. We're so excited to write the story as fast as we can because NBC was at the time in the toilet. Their ratings were zero <laughs> in the era. Yeah, of- the, the, for, for people in the audience, this is before the A-Team, this is before the Cosby show. I mean, uh, you know, they, right. it was, if people think of NBC as must-see TV, just imagine the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, how it was in those days, it was don't see TV, and, uh, <laughs> and and you know this was also before gazillions of channels. It was before Fox even had a dream of raising their heads, and uh, and there were only three networks, and the other two were just screaming along, and NBC was like really in trouble, and Brandon wanted something, some stuff that could really help turn it around, and that would have, and he saw V as being that kind of of, of big moment vehicle, um, and um, uh, so he said, just please write it as fast as you can. Uh, and I had already done all the research, uh, underlying research about the resistance and about the rise of Hitler and, and all of that. So I had already done a lot of my homework already. Uh, and it was just a question of seeing how it would uh, play out in, in this new uh, vision, uh, which which really happened very quickly. I put the story together in, I don't know, three or four weeks at the most, I think. And uh, and then said, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, carve out a couple hours. I'm going to come and tell you the story. And Brandon said, "Well, no, no, just just send us the just send us the story. We'll read it." And I said, "You guys don't know how to read, you know. <laughs> I will come and tell you the story." And part of the reason I wanted to do that was very calculated because 
when you send them pages, then they can sit back and have notes and kick around things and get ideas and say, well, this is not going to work for this, that, and the other reason. But when you're in a room with them and they start to raise a question like that, you can pinch it off right away and answer it and resolve it and just keep moving along. And I knew Brandon was eager to hurry, so he got on board. And I went over and sat in his office uh, and, and sat there and I told them the story. Now, this was a story that had no character names in it. Donovan was called the cameraman. Faye was Faye's character, Julie, that was called the med student. Uh, because I knew that if I tried to tell them a story with uh, 60 different names in it, they'd never remember who was what, you know. Tony, uh, Donovan's partner, was called the sidekick. And, um, uh, and, and that way I could get them through the story. And it took about an hour and a half or more of me just sitting there and these guys just sitting there listening. And uh, none of them fell asleep. I was pleased to see. That's the first step, you know. And uh, I have had that happen to me. And, and actually in an, in an executive meeting one time where somebody said to me, you got to keep things going along because he, he actually nod, he nods off, you know. And so I yeah, think, well, yeah, I know what that they're figuratively, right? And I'm in a meeting with this then president of NBC uh, later in life. And they said, he's, you know, and they had given me that warning, watch out, you know, his attention span. And literally in the middle of me pitching him this uh, story, uh, the, the series idea with Kelsey Grammer sitting beside me, the biggest star on the network at the time, who was behind it with me. Uh, and the president of NBC starts going like this, you know, and uh, I'm literally his eyelids are hanging at half mast. And Kelsey and I look at each other and go, holy sh Goodness you goodness. can yeah. you can swear if you want to. It's oh, okay. Shit. He really is falling asleep. So we looked at each other and we said, okay, and then bang, you know, and then boom, we had to keep him awake long enough. Was, he lasted about uh, uh, another six months in the job and uh, uh, and took NBC into the toilet again. Um, and so naturally, but, but see that that there. seems typical of your network executive stories. And uh, the reason why I want to talk about Brennan Tartikoff for a second yes. is that you know the most the you know the most well known example of his instincts was whether it's true or not. He wrote MTV Cops on a piece of paper, slid it across to Michael Mann, and he came back with Miami Vice. Right, and he kind of became you know, he kind of became a star in his own right. I'm pretty sure he hosted SNL at one point, And if he didn't, he was at least on it. <laughs> yeah, no, he, probably, he probably did. He also, don't forget, uh, uh, saw Mr. T once signing autographs and said, okay, we got to do something with that. And he called my pal, Steve Cannell and said, I got Mr. T, <laughs> you know, uh, put him out of contract or something. And he said, what can you do with him? And Steve thought, oh, well, I'll think of something. <laughs> and uh, uh, And that's where the A-team came from. What, what uh, I've always heard about Brandon Tartikoff is that, uh, you know, he had these good instincts, but he was also a really personable guy. The way you're talking about it sounds like for uh, decades, I worked for the comedian Dennis Miller, speaking of SNL, and he told me a story once about he knew Brandon really well. And he got a call in the middle of the afternoon, hadn't talked to Brandon in a little while. Brandon is like, Dennis, it's Brandon. He's like, yeah, what's going on? I'm at lunch with Jerry Lewis. He just went to the bathroom. He's cried <laughs> three times. I'll call you back. <laughs> and just the fact that like he knew how much Dennis was, the fact that he told me that story decades later is like, yeah, he definitely gets, you know, those sort of situations. He's like, I know no, what's yeah. funny. I know what's good, you know? It, that, well, that's true. And it, it's funny. And I, I mean, he, he also had, he had great instincts about a lot of things and really terrible instincts about some things sometimes too. Uh, uh, after in 1984, I did a pilot for him uh, called Hot Pursuit. It was about sort of a husband and wife as fugitive on the road together. Um, and we did a pilot and, and the series didn't last long because they put it on Saturday night at 10 o'clock in the graveyard time period. Oh, yeah. uh, but I was, I was filming it in New Orleans and I got a call one night from Brandon and he said, uh, I got a better title. I said, you got a better title on Hot Pursuit? Really? What is it? He said, he said, Highway to Heaven. And I said, <laughs> Highway to Heaven. I said, Brandon, that's that doesn't have the the heat and the the sexuality and the 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 the, the drive that I mean, you know what Highway to Heaven is? I was literally sitting in my bed early in the evening in uh, in New Orleans. I said, Highway to Heaven 
would be a, an angel show, okay? And it would be about a, an angel who probably hadn't earned enough points or something to get an Emmy, and he has to come back here, and he picks up like a human sidekick or something like that, and they go on, you know, episode after episode, doing good things so that he can work his way up the highway back into heaven. And Brandon said, huh, yeah, okay, I guess you're right. And about six months later, I see that Highway to Heaven is going into production. <laughs> and I called him up with, with uh, uh, yes. Michael Landon. Thank you, Michael. And, uh, and I called him up and, and I said, um, Brandon, remember the night you called me in New Orleans? And he said, yeah. And I reminded him of the story. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, Michael came in and pitched this idea to me. And I said, no, let me tell you what happened. What happened is that Michael Landon came in and said, I want to do a series about a one-armed blind paper hanger in uh, Halifax. And you said, what if he was an angel? <laughs> and Brandon said, I think I owe you one, Kenny. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, you know and, that's, and that's, but he was a great guy. And, um, and they sat in the meeting while I was telling the story of V. Uh, and when I finished, Brandon said, they all did actually, he said, wow. Um, and uh, he said, how long do you think it is? Uh, and I said, uh, he said, six hours or something for a miniseries? And I said, I think I can do it in four. But he said, well, however long it is, that's how long it'll be. <clears throat> and I said, okay, so I should, I should, you want me to go write the script? And he said, oh, yes, I want you to write the script right now. I said, well, what are notes, ideas? Everybody said, no, 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 just, just what you told us, just go write it. And so I sat down and in 19 days, I finished writing in long hand on a yellow legal pad before wow. computers. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I wrote a 231 page screenplay in 19 days. Um, and uh, it's also all the dialogue also is in iambic pentameter. Ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum. Um, and um, uh, and that was because I had just been working on an idea to do Ivanhoe as a miniseries, and I wanted Ivanhoe to have a sort of a classic kind of feel to it. Uh, and in looking at a number of classic movies like The Lion in Winter and The Man Who Would Be King, and, you know, things like that, uh, I wanted to have the right kind of feel for it. <clears throat> and in listening to The Lion in Winter, I began to realize that the dialogue went my life, when it is written, will read better than it lived. Henry Fitz Empress, first Plantagenet. The no I said, son of a gun. <laughs> Golden wrote this this play in iambic in meter. It wasn't in pentameter. It wasn't divided into verses, but it was iambic. Ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. And and I thought, oh, gee, that's fun. Uh, and I wrote Ivanhoe that way. And when I, and I had that kind of pace in my head as I began to write the dialogue for V and I just sort of automatically fell into starting to write it with of course we suffered losses man you don't go up against a force like theirs until you know you know and it's that's what it is and uh and just, I uh, just to interrupt the, the the way that uh the way that just last week the way that I watched it is it in iambic pentameter is this all the this dialogue all the, all the dialogue in the in the in the miniseries is in iambic you know, and uh, and and you know, as I said, it's not broken into meter. And sure. where one person finishes, the next person picks up. But the meter continues, ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum, all the way through. And uh, 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 several of the actors came to me uh, when we were filming, and I didn't tell. The only one I mentioned it to was Mark, uh, because Mark. Uh, part of the reason Mark got the job was because I had seen him do Petruchio in the Taming of the Shrew uh, some years earlier, I think on a, on a PBS broadcast of it. He was up with the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, and he was dazzling. I mean, he was a wonderful, huge physical guy, but also really a great Shakespearean actor. So I mentioned it to him, and, and he had already spotted it, you know. Uh, and but no, the other, a lot of the other actors would say, you know, it's the funniest thing about the dialogue. It, your dialogue seems to be easier to to memorize than anything I ever have before. And uh, I said, really? Well, hmm. and that's uh, it was a factor that I think that Shakespeare was aware of too. You know, when you've got to get a lot of words in a hurry, and they got to get learned in a hurry. If you write it in meter, it works better. <laughs> you know, so he never shared that with me. Shakespeare did, but it, it, it's something. But it's um, uh, at any rate, it was. Uh, I wrote the script in 19 days, um, and. Um, and Brandon read it over a weekend. And this is an interesting part that not a lot of people know. And that is that uh, normally when you're doing a big mini series with a cast of almost 70 people uh, speaking roles, and it's three, it's, four, it's gonna be three and a half hours of film, four hours long on TV. 
uh, you have, uh, you know, about four months or so to prep it, to get it ready, to get stuff built, to get the casting done, to find the locations and all of that. Uh, and four months is, is normal and, and short a little bit. But Brandon was in such a hurry that he, he was so eager to get it done. <laughs> he said, really get it going as fast as you can. And what, the, what that meant was that from the weekend that he read the final draft of the script, which was very, it was really the first draft of the script. Um, uh, he said, and he said, go until the day I said action. That prep time was two and a half weeks. That's oh, the, no. I mean, people in the industry go, no, that's impossible. That's bullshit. Never, never happened. No, it's, that's exactly what it took. I mean, you would think with that little turnaround, you know, maybe like Roger Corman might have done that. Maybe Troma Films, you know, the company that makes Toxic Avenger. There's there's a lot, you know, I mean, it, that's so crazy. But uh, I, I think that I, I remember reading something where you talked about this. The one advantage you had is you had this crew that you worked with for not quite a decade, but for years. Five years. Five years. Five five years, years incredible. Oh, and actually several of them uh, were on my bionic cruise before that for a couple of years before that. So, yes, I had a, a crew at Universal that had worked together and was tight knit and you know we answered each other's we finished each other's sentences and and they knew me and and and, and how much i was eager to have them contribute you know when i always would uh, you know when i didn't know how to do something well i'll, I'll tell you that story too about uh, when the uh, when we were at the production meeting uh and i had all the keys sitting around the, the, the table and we're going through it page by page uh in our prep and we got to the page where it says, okay, Diana picks up this guinea pig and her mouth opens and opens and opens until it's inhumanly wide. And she puts the guinea pig in her mouth and it goes down her throat. And there was, you know, the little pause in the, in the, uh, in the room where we were all, and the crew was sort of chuckling. And, and Tommy Reba, my special effects guru said, how are we gonna do that, Kenny? And I gave him my favorite answer. Beats the shit out of me, Tom. <laughs> you know, I just write this stuff, you know. Uh, and and I said, why don't you get with Warner Kepler, our uh, makeup guru, who had created the uh, the head for uh, the Incredible Hulk for me originally. It still sits in the in the uh, kitchen here in our, at our offices, um, and uh, see what you can come up with. And I love always challenging my crew like that to say, I don't know, you know, help me do, help me come up with stuff. And they did, and they managed to uh, to make it work. The outtakes are pretty funny, uh, we, uh, because because we had to uh, we had they had to create a full head based on Jane Badler's face. They did a, a, a head cast and. Uh, uh, and a life mask, and then created the uh, the a full head where with a little pushing down a little lever in the back, you could get the mouth to open this wide, you know. And um, uh, the problem was then getting the guinea pig to go in the mouth, and it's actually Jane's hand behind. She was behind the the dummy head, and it was Jane's hand that was putting the uh, the guinea pig in. And in the you'll. <laughs> it took about 15 minutes and about 25 takes to get <laughs> one that worked. Uh, because the, uh, the the guinea pigs kept going, rah, rah, I don't want to go in there, rah, you know. And, uh, the guinea pigs uh, only natural. Uh, that's the only the guinea pigs only natural defense is the squeal, right? That's so, right. Well, that well, that and they put their hand, they put their paws out, which which means they don't go in the mouth. And it was it was challenging. I think in the DVD, uh, I might have even <laughs> said that uh, that no guinea pigs were harmed in the uh, making of the V. However, several of them did go to therapy, you know, <laughs> because it was it was scary. But at any rate, we only had two and a half weeks to prep. And and you're right. Fortunately, I had my crew with me uh, that I'd worked with for so long, including John McPherson, my brilliant cinematographer, uh, Emmy award winner. And, uh, uh, and, and, uh, Chuck Davis, who was the production designer for me on Bionic Woman and all of the Hulk, uh, who created all of the, uh, spacecraft designs over a weekend, uh, sitting at home. And, uh, uh, and it was, it was interesting too, because the, uh, except for changes that I made in the script, we shot the white pages of my first draft screenplay. Um, and uh, it was only recently I remembered that there was one scene that I had written. Uh, it was a chase sequence where Donovan was gonna meet Julie for the first time. And it was about halfway through uh, the miniseries. Uh, and we were looking for locations out in Long Beach. Um, I don't think I've ever told this story before. 
and uh, and and I couldn't we couldn't find a location that would, was really feeling right for it, and somehow it all just didn't feel right. And we hit a broke for lunch while we were over there, and the crew was in having lunch, and I'm sitting out on the curb with a script in my hand, going through it and back and forth. And finally, I said, "You know what? This scene's a mistake. I don't, we don't need to shoot this scene. The, the story plays better without it, and it's going to be better if it's Donna. If Donovan is not the guy that puts a gun in her hand for the first time." Um, she's at the end of the, mini, of the miniseries, which it ultimately does. And I just tore seven pages out of the script and called Universal uh, uh, Warners and said, I'm taking this scene out. And they said, that's great, because it saved them $150,000. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the story worked better without it. So it was uh, one of the few uh, essential pieces that I took out that uh, we never shot. And there's no film on the floor. And uh, uh, it, was, um, it was the right choice. And and the movie moved forward well. Uh, that, yeah, that, that's amazing. I mean, considering all of these factors, it's it's just it's astounding that that you had a product of the quality that you had at the end of it. It's it's amazing. It it doesn't it's it's just not computing in my brain. Um, the the Diana scene that that you were just discussing with the guinea pig um, that is probably the signature uh, iconic moment that really grabbed audiences it's i have a hazy memory of it from when i was almost seven well, years old like two years old probably yeah. yes i know <laughs> I, I was almost seven but yeah well i'll, I'll interrupt and uh, you know eventually my parents told me about it because we didn't have a vcr yet so they were telling me about this show and that was i remember my mom describing it to me and i'm like oh my god i gotta watch this but uh, anyway back to your point john yeah um but um uh, you know, as you said, the the bringing the sci-fi aspect into it, you capture the younger audience. Um, but that was still that was a little too far for for a lot of kids, I think, at the time, in theory. But in reality, it, well, we were wrapped up in it completely. Um, and you know, I'm I'm seventy percent sure I saw that Diana scene live. I didn't see the full <laughs> original miniseries, right. but I, I do remember that happening. Um, and I remember talking about V with other kids in school, which, you know, that's like, territory that was like what, Christian. Yeah, um, like me, like we, we literally met in second grade. My son's in second grade now. Yeah. And so it's crazy to think about that aspect of it. But, you know, in a lot of ways, these characters were just as important to us in 1983 as Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. You know, I mean, we talked about them in the same way. We might play Star Wars on the playground one day, but then we were playing V the next day, you know. Okay. Maybe we'd play yeah. Battlestar Galactica one day, but then we go back to V, you know, or, and you it was like, be, or you'd be running bionically in the parking lot going. Gee, 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 gee. Sure. <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. Anytime um, I read anywhere, I made those sound effects. <laughs> no, well, that's, that, and that's, and what you both are saying is, is something that I, that I've heard a lot. I mean, when I did the DVD release and I put an email uh, address where people could write me, you know, beware what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, amazing. And it continues to be to this day, the amount of the volume of, uh, uh, of emails that come in and how many of them say I was seven or eight or 10 or 12 when it first aired and I loved it. I love the action, the vision, and all, yada, yada, yada. But now I'm looking at it in my middle ages are 35 or 40 and I'm going, oh, wow, there was a lot more yep. going on there than I realized. <laughs> and uh, and that's really rewarding when you can create what the, the industry calls a four quadrant show. Four quadrant, you know, meaning it hits four different levels of audience. It hits the kids, it hits the teens, it hits the adult men and adult women. And uh, what's interesting about my work is that our, my largest audience ha of those four has been adult women. Uh, from the Bionic Woman, through the Incredible Hulk, through V, through Alien Nation, which, and it's really unusual in when you're working in the world of science fiction and fantasy like that, to have a female uh, audience that are that want to be there and haven't just been dragged there, but in some cases are dragging their family members to it. And it, it's funny because I, I, I never sort of sat down to pander to that and all that thing. I think I'll write this so that a female audience will like it. I wouldn't know what that was. I just always wrote what I liked and what I felt was the right thing for the story. And and also I felt that, that women in this industry have been wildly underused. Actresses so often are going up for the part of the girlfriend or the wife. Uh, 
you know, and as opposed to having them be heroic, having them to be strong, uh, empowered women. And, uh, uh, and that band with, began with the Bionic Woman. When uh, I wrote the original script for a Six Million Dollar Man, um, and at the end of my draft, first draft, uh, she lived, but she was in a off with Walt Disney's head somewhere, you know, in a <laughs> hyper, hyper, some sort of hibernation. Uh, and the studio said, no, 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 we have to kill her. We want, we want to do a love story. I said, this is a bad idea. It's a good character. He said, no, 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 dead, dead, dead. Uh, so I said, okay, cerebral hemorrhage in the most advanced medical facility in the world, uh, she's dead. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then after the show went on the air, uh, the letters started coming in to Universal and to, uh, uh, and to ABC saying, wow, what this, they were, it, my favorite came from the head of the psychology department of Boston University, who wrote, how dare you create this archetypical heroine, this empowered female, this role model, and just throw her out the, you know, and, uh, and the network saw those letters, but more importantly, they saw the ratings that had happened to Six Mill because of Bionic Woman. The ratings had, on Six Mill had really gone up. And so they came to me and they said, yeah, it really was a stupid idea, Kenny. Why did you kill her anyway? You know, and, uh, <laughs> you know bring her back. I said, oh, sure, piece of cake. And uh, so, uh, but because of that, uh, you know, I, it was it was wonderful because we had I had brought into the world this character that really was a stand up and standalone female heroine, um, and it's it's because I always saw women as equal to men. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I was raised by uh, uh, my my mother and stepfather. My mother was was really the driving force in the family, and she was a businesswoman as well as a mother. Uh, she was always available when I needed her to do anything for school that I was doing. But at the same time, she had full time jobs going on, uh, and I saw her holding her own with in a man's world. Uh, and I always saw her as equal. I had no idea she was probably getting paid half of what they were. But, uh, but so I had this sort of feminist instinct before there was a word for it. Um, and, uh, and when I began looking at the, the heroes of the resistance uh, for, for creating V, I, I came across the story of uh, Andre de Jong, uh, a French woman, actually, actually she was Belgique, uh, she had been a, a commercial artist before the war, and during the war, she became a nurse. She was 19, 20, 21 years old at the, at the oldest, and a, and a wispy of a thing. She was under 100 pounds and a girl. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, she, in, in, after uh, occupation had happened in France, she discovered some RAF flyers that had been downed in France and were hiding. And she said, uh, how about I take you to Spain and we'll, we'll get you out of there. And they, they said, well, how can you do that? She said, I'll lead you over the Pyrenees. And, and this is a girl like in bobby socks, you know, and the flyers are going, right, kid, you know. And she said, you want to go or not? And she did. She led him over the, on foot over the Pyrenees uh, down to Bilbao in Spain. And when she got there, the Spaniards said, how did you do this? And she said, I put one foot in front of the other and led them over. Would you like me to bring more? And <laughs> she did. She brought hundreds uh, of men of down flyers over the Pyrenees and, and, and created what was called the Comet Line. She was so fast. Uh, then she became one of, the, one of the heroes. At one point, the Nazis actually caught her. And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, beat up on her a little bit. And so, so finally she told them the truth and they said, don't be ridiculous. You couldn't do that. You're a girl, you know, and they set her aside. They sent her to one of the concentration camps, which she survived, but she got terribly emaciated while she was there. And at, during, at one point, some of the, the Nazi types said, you know, maybe we should talk more to that girl. And they couldn't figure out who she was because in the concentration camp, oh, no. You know, yeah. from the, and uh, she survived the camps and and, and lived until she was uh, in into into the eighties. Faye actually tried to contact her to do research when we were doing the uh, when we were doing V, uh, and wasn't able to get to her. But uh, Faye and did in indeed get through to a woman named Marie Madeleine Forcode, who was also under 100 pounds, Bobby Soxer, 20 years old, and, uh, and one of the leaders uh, in France of the resistance. Uh, and the, the Nazis even had a code name for her. She would call Hedgehog. 
uh, and um, uh, and they tried to ca- they never captured her. They got and she did all kinds of amazing stuff. And I thought that's what I really wanted to see was a a female character like that who could lead the resistance. And the extra wrinkle that I added to Faye's character was that she didn't seek it. Mm-hmm. You know, she didn't set out to be the. And and one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when she's trying to repair broken the broken water thing in their underground headquarters, and she's you know she's furious and sobbing and then and, and, and Ruby comes in her her guru or uh, Yoda figure mm-hmm. the wizard and uh, and you know takes her in her arms and and says you just have to trust yourself like we do she said but what if I can't and Ruby says fake it we won't know the difference mm-hmm. <laughs> you know and and I love that scene because it it, it sets up Faye as being uh, the reluctant heroine the yeah. reluctant leader uh, which pro- pro- which proceeds through all the way the whole thing, and she doesn't fire a gun until actually the final moment when she's totally outgunned by this uh, this you know little spacecraft coming in at her. Uh, you know, uh, one of my fans sent me this, Excellent. and um, uh, and and it was uh, it was such a moment of perfect heroism uh, where she says, "I'm going to go down, but I'm going to." go down fighting she could not have embodied the character better and Faye I had worked with on a TV movie for CBS called Senior Trip uh, in 1981 just a year earlier uh, where uh, it was sort of American graffiti on the road it was like uh, I, my autobiographical musical comedy about my senior class trip to New York City when I was uh, a senior in high school we went to New York City and the different kids on the bus who had different ideas of what they wanted to do in New York uh, and um, uh, and Faye was the girl that was trying to change her image because she was the girl with the checkered past you know mm-hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and Faye was just knockout, so good in it. And when I started writing V, I said, oh, all right, I got it. I got Andre DeJong, I got Faye Grant, and uh, bingo. Uh, and she came on board, and, and NBC was thrilled. One of the questions I asked Brandon early on is, how are you planning to cast it? Uh, because, you know, miniseries always had had uh, at least uh, some movie stars in them, and, and at very least TV stars. Uh, but uh, Brandon said, we don't need any stars for this, Kenny. He said, the story that you've written is going to carry the day. And uh, I said, are you sure? I mean, we don't, yeah, and, and, and the, Brandon was really confident about that. Uh, and also, I think he was also looking at, okay, if we can take this into a series, I'm not going to maybe get be able to get a m- movie star that's going to want to stay with the series. Um, so we uh, we started casting, and then it was, I just hired the best actors I could find as fast as Cynthia Hoffman, the casting director, could bring them in to see me. And as soon as I got the, as soon as somebody came in and read and I loved it, I said, okay, that's her. Now we don't need to look at it anymore. Now let's go on to the next character that we've got to find. And um, uh, and it was, it was a frantic time, but uh, but that's how, that's how that came about. Uh, you, you touched on a lot here that I wanted to cover. Um, the but the reluctant hero is is always a, a an effective um, trope, I guess. Um, but the the strong female characters is something that always stood out to me as well um, it, it, on both sides of it, right? Because you had the sides. character of Diana, mm-hmm. um, who is the incredibly lady, yes. yeah. <laughs> uh, but th- as you said, this is still in the really early days of having having powerful female characters, and you know, particularly villains. Um, and I think the most fascinating element of her story arc to me was that she wasn't number one in the chain of command, but everybody understood from the very beginning that she was the actual power. And I I was was wondering if that was your intent with it or did Jane Badler's performance push it in that direction? No, that was the intent. That's how she was written. And, uh, uh, and that's what, uh, what I wanted to, uh, you know, and I, and also I wanted to, uh, play with uh, the fact that she had she was a creature of many appetites. You know, not only did they include guinea pigs, but they also included members of the same sex, as well as members of the opposite sex. You know, and uh, uh, I've had so many questions about that little moment where she walks behind uh, Jenny Sullivan and, and runs her finger across Jenny's shoulders. And they say, were you really? I said, was I really? Is it was it isn't like right on the nose there? You know? <laughs> yes. And um, uh, and that's uh, that's what I had always planned for her. And uh, 
uh, and it was, um, uh, and, and Jane was one of the last cast. We had started shooting, I think we'd shot a week of, uh, already before Jane. I'd read a lot of actresses and I just couldn't, and are really good at fine actresses, but I just couldn't find one that, that seemed to have it all. And, and we, after filming one night uh, and been up being, being up for 14 hours already, they said, could you come by the studio? We've got this uh, actress that we really like. And I walked into the room and I saw Jane and I thought, Okay, let's let's and, and I saw those eyes and that extraordinary face, and I said, "Please God, let her be able to at least say her name, you know, <laughs> you know if she can act at all, you know." And and then uh, she and I started reading the the scene together because I always read with my actors uh, personally. As I just oftentimes I discovered I could give them more than a lot of casting directors who are casting directors because they're not actors, you know, and, um, uh, and, uh, and she just caught the wave r r right from the very first time we started reading together. And I said, okay, what a relief. We have a Diana. Now I got to get back to the set. <laughs> you know? And, um, uh, but Mark had been, was cast only the night on the Friday night before we started filming on Monday. Uh, we still, we had a lot of people, a, a lot of actors that I respected and liked, but nobody just quite felt right. And and then I remembered Petruchio, you know, and I said, well, and, and, I, and I said, what's he been doing? Well, he did done this show called Beastmaster. And uh, mm -hmm. um, and when he came in to read uh, several of the, I looked at several of the women and they said, well, I wouldn't kick him out of bed. You know? <laughs> and I said, okay, well, this is close. And then Mark started reading it and it was like, it was. It took about ten seconds, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and it was. It wasn't just because it was six o'clock on Friday night before we had to start shooting. It was because he was the right guy. Right, and then also like as the kids in the audience. I mean, even like physically, you can kind of see at least a slight resemblance. There's like a very like Luke Skywalker quality about him, though. You know, yeah. he's got like a Mark Hamill haircut, and that's <laughs> not a knock in any way. And no. you know, as a kid, as a kid, those are the characters that you're like you're so excited about because that's you know the actions and heroes when you watch it as an adult you're like wow ruby had some great stuff in this but i, I think abraham is the unsung yep. hero of this entire series Absolutely. and just watching it as an adult i'm like oh right he, he they he, they just take him and that's and he's gone you don't see him again and uh you know that's like oh that's 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 what happened and i think that you know even as a kid you you know he's there to kind of like you know oh you think this can't happen this is the guy who's reminding you, oh, it happened. It wasn't that long ago. And I've he reminds there. his son, we put you in a suitcase, you know, and, right. you know, your mother didn't have a heart attack. I'm, I'm actually recanting it, uh, recounting it to you. And I'm like getting little chills just thinking <laughs> about the way that he said it. And, you know, now that you tell me that's iamic pentameter, I'm like, well, of course, everything he said. You know, <laughs> so but uh, talk so about. Just you know, I if mean, you're going, those... if you're going to do it, do it right. You hear, ba bum, yeah. ba bum, ba bum, right. ba bum. But and you know, it's funny that that particular line, Christian, uh, sticks with me even when I'm re repairing something at home and I'm trying to fix it. I go, yeah, that's good enough. And then I hear Leonardo saying, if you're going to do it, do it right. You know, <laughs> and and he was, he just was so perfect uh, in in the in the role and in the performance and. Uh, uh, and in the camaraderie, I, I mean, I, I uh, never yet, except for Alien Nation, where I also assembled a, an amazing re repertory company, but the one in V was so much larger. Uh, and it, I, I have never had the opportunity to work with so many gifted actors on such a short time. Well, it's, even, it's even like smaller, smaller parts. Like I forgot Joanna Kearns played Mike's ex-husband, ex-wife, you know, and she was, you know, TV mom just a few years later and she's right. on the Mount Rushmore of Lifetime movies. And I'm right. like, she has such a small part in this. And like, it's like, oh, she's great. You know, she only has like a couple of really, you know, really, you know, and she's like, like how am I going to compete with a husband? How do I compete with them? With, with pizza? Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. yeah it's uh, the way she, she delivers that line. That's yeah. right. Well, you know, I'll tell you, my my um, the best day yet I have ever had in my career was um, we had finished filming. I had four editors working simultaneously on uh, the, all my team from Bionic and Hulk and uh, and one new guy, uh, and they all had different pieces of the puzzle, uh, and and we've been scrambling to try to get it put together. Uh, and, and I, and, and no, but nope, we hadn't seen the whole thing. And finally I said, they all felt that the, the pieces were where that we wanted them to be. And I said, look, look, 
whether they are or not, we got to tape it together and just run it in a room where we can sit. And so we did. And we sat down in, in screening room two, one of the small ones at the uh, by the front offices of Warner Brothers or the executive ones. Uh, small screening room, you know, holds 10 or 12 people max, not even that many, I don't think. And we sat there for three and a half hours. And we, we and what we were watching was the raw first cut of the picture. There were no special effects, uh, visual effects at all. There was no sound effects. There was no musical score, which was going to be so important with this 100 piece orchestra. Um, there was just the actors working. And it took your head off uh, emotionally because every one of them had absolutely been on their game at the top of their game. And there was not a weak moment or a weak performance or anywhere. And, and, uh, and when the lights came up, I sat there with uh, uh, Alan and, and the guys and, and uh, Alan Marks, one of my editors from those days is still around. He's, 98 now and uh, uh, he had been a flyer in world war ii uh, with the raf uh and um uh and we were all looking at each other going whoa we we really have done something here's something and uh and i called brandon uh from the screening room and i said hey listen i just want to let you know we just saw this and um uh, and you're going to be really happy because it, it wrote really the emotional structure is so powerful that all of the special effects and the music and the razzle dazzle and the lasers and that it's it's frosting but we have baked the cake brandon and i and, and he said oh, that's, it's great it's great i said yeah but there's one problem said, what's the problem i said well we said four hours right and he said yeah yeah i said well it's four hours and 15 minutes with commercials and he said well yeah okay well we'll just trim it down a little bit and i said that's where we have a problem um, because nobody's better at killing his babies than Kenny is. I mean, I have been in many editing rooms where I say, oh my God, it was so hard to get that shot, but it slows the movie down. I got to take it out. Or I love that line. That was my favorite line. Ah, you know, it has to go for one reason or another. And um, I said, I, I do that all the time, Brandon, but I need you to come take a look because I don't, none of us can see, particularly me, what we could cut that wouldn't hurt the picture by being taken out of it. And he said, okay, I'll be there tomorrow. Where do you want me? You know? And he came over the next day, sitting in, sitting in the same screening room with us. We go through it, three and a half hours straight through. And uh, ends, the lights come up, Brandon's sitting there. Uh, and I'm going, <laughs> and, and, uh, um, and, he, and, and he said, can we go outside? And I said, Sure, <laughs> you know, and uh, went outside, and he's still going. Oh, oh, oh. I said, "What are you thinking?" He said, "I'm thinking that I have to go to the affiliates stations and ask them if they will give me 15 more minutes." And I said, "Can you do that?" And he said, "Beats the shit out of me." <laughs> he used my line, <laughs> you know, and he said, "No, I said I don't think anybody ever has, but uh, I'm going to try." And that's what he did. He was a man true to his word. He said, well, however long it is, that's how long it'll be. And the first night of V ran from nine until 1115. And around America, people were going, wait a minute, whatever the news. I mean, it's, it's, you know, yeah, yeah. And, um, and of course, it was the highest rated show NBC had had in two and a half years. And uh, uh, the, the, uh, in the top 15 highest rated miniseries ever, the only miniseries ever that had no stars in it to this day. There's never been another one. And, and it is uh, with a 40 share and, and 80 million people tuning in in North America alone, uh, it, it's the highest rated work of science fiction that's ever been on television. And, and, and in the present day, that many people don't even watch the Super Bowl anymore. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no so. but it's, it was certainly what Brandon was looking for, yeah. you know, and, and, part, and, and there's several reasons for it. Um, uh, and one of the key reasons is the, the way we chose to advertise and promote it. And uh, I have to t go back one step. When I was doing the, 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 bio, the Hulk uh, at CBS, uh, the guy that was head of advertising and publicity at CBS was this really annoying guy named Steve Somer. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and when I when we did the Hulk and we did the pilot, uh, and then Steve put out a, a full page ad to announce it with 
And I had sold my soul to Bill Bixby to get him to play the lead because I wanted, I needed that infusion of class, of popularity, of TV stardom, and uh, and, uh, and an actor whom the audience loved from Eddie's father and all, um, to to help make this ridiculous comic book premise work as in the real world. Uh, and Somer took an ad that was full page, Lou Ferrigno, banner headline, Green Monster on the Loose, with a little line at the bottom that said, starring Bill Bixby, you know. And, <laughs> and I mean, first I had to peel Bixby off the ceiling, you know. <laughs> and then I, and I sat down with Steve and I said, you imbecile, don't you say, we're going to get the kids, they're going to come. What you've got to get to is the, the adult audience. And we, we'd have these battles, and they went on for a couple of years. It was so frustrating. And, and so fade out, fade in. Now we're doing V. Uh, Brennan's seen what he's seen, and he's so excited about it and thrilled. And he said, I just hired this new guy to be head of ad pub for NBC. And I said, yeah, who? And he said, Steve. I said, no, 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 don't. You know? and, and I realized, oh, my God. Uh, and I told Brandon the story. And he said, well, go talk to him. I said, yeah, I, I, I will. I'll try. And, and, and I went to Steve and, and I said, look, you don't like me, Steve. I know that because you think I meddle in what you do and you do very well. I have trouble with you sometimes because I don't think you always get what the essence is that we're really trying to sell here. You know? And, um, um, and I, uh, but I, I got an idea. Let me just throw it out to you and see, if, what do you think? I said, did you ever see the Nazi propaganda posters? And he said, what do you mean? Like, like the, the Wehrmacht soldier with the little girl on his shoulder, you know? And I said, yeah, that's right. We're the Nazis, we're the new guys in town. Hi, happy to, you know, the, the English are going to start mining the English channel. We are going to take care of that for you, you know? And, and uh, I said, let's make propaganda posters about, yes, that friendship is universal. Uh, this is one of four that uh, Chuck Davis created uh, for, for us to put uh, in the movie and also for Steve to use um, in the advertising campaign because he put these posters up uh, on subway walls, on bus stops, on buses, on billboards. Uh, and I said, but here's what you do, Steve. Here's the way to do it. Put just this up with no mention of NBC or V or anything. And like three weeks before the movie, just get a stir going. And then the second week, send out crews of kids in all the towns around the country with cans of red spray paint and deface your own poster. The spray of big red V's over it. And then the last week, just put a little banner on the corner that says the battle begins on NBC. And Steve, bless his heart, came out of his chair with enthusiasm <laughs> and really spent a couple of million dollars, which in 82 was a lot of money, 83. Uh, to do exactly that. And so, so we had that push. Um, we also had the footage that we had created in the show and the execution of it. And, uh, and then the week or so before the show went on the air, the reviews started coming in from the Washington Post and the New York Times and the New York Daily News and the San Francisco Chronicle and the Philadelphia Inquirer and all the big papers just with raves about everything and every aspect of it and uh, singled out so many performances and, and Faye and, and Mark and Jane and, and, uh, and Joe Harnell's extraordinary music that we did. And, um, uh, and so we had all of that push behind us and Steve also created a, uh, uh, an on-air promo campaign about, you know, only seven days until they arrive. And we were very careful not to show very much of who they were. Uh, because the audience wanted to, I wanted to play their imaginations, you know, and, uh, and so that's what worked. And that's why the audiences came. And the, the beauty of it, though, is that once they came, they didn't tune out. Normally on a four hour miniseries, if, if you get good ratings going in and initial tune in, that's great. But it's where does it go? Does it keep going up or does it go up for about an hour and a half and then begin to fall off? The V ratings just kept climbing all the way through to the very end on both nights. And uh, uh, and it was it was an amazing thing to see and to to know that, and it was because but but the core of it the core of it was that that day in in screening room two, where I saw just the actors doing it, mm -hmm. and when we saw the emotional impact that they had in working together, uh, we we knew that it was just going to be sensational. Yeah, uh, it, with that in mind, I wanted to circle back on uh, one bit of casting because it, it's so noteworthy from his work that followed. 
is how great Robert England is as, as <laughs> Willie because he's so different than the biggest role he ever played, which is Freddy Krueger. He's, I would say the opposite, you know, Freddy Krueger, who's a, you know, a child molester gets burned alive and then haunts right. children in their dreams. You know, it's like, yeah, Willie is the opposite of that. He's the, he's, he's the way in to be like, Oh look, they're not all bad. But right. uh, he, well, there were good Nazis. Certain. Yeah, that was, I wanted to play right. the fact that there was a spectrum on both sides of the fence. You know that Martin, played by Frank Ashmore, perfectly, uh, yeah. was 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 one of the people that were on our side. And uh, Jenny Newman, who played the the, the role of uh, uh, Barbara in the piece, who was also uh, an ally of ours. And and Willie, of course. You know, it was. It's it's funny. I, I uh, Christian, I, I just uh, saw. Uh, there's a podcast that's done by uh, uh, Billy and Dom, the two hobbits from um, uh, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings it's called yeah. the, Friend, the Friendship Onion. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's wonderful. And they they telecast it too, not just audio. Um, and they had they had Robert on, and and Susie, my wife, said, "Hey, you ought to come look at this." And I came in, and um, and 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 Robert's there uh, talking about how about his audition for me. He said, I, he said, I can, I went into the audition and, and I said to Kenny, uh, uh, I don't know what to do with this. I, I said, I, he said, I have no idea how to, 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 to get into this character. I, I, I mean, you give me a, a, a mustache or a cane or a hat or something. And I can create a character, but I'm an alien that speaks Arabic. I, I, I don't know. And, and he was really in the, in, the, in the room, in the office, we were in talking, really frazzled about it. And, and then he said to Billy and Dom, he said, and then Kenny just said two words to me. And I'm thinking, I did, <laughs> you know, what, what two words would I, and, and they, and so he gives a big pause and he said, Kenny just looked at me and said, Robert, Gene Wilder. And I thought, that's a terrible direction to give to an actor, you know, <laughs> you know, act like another actor. And, uh, but Robert explained that that was exactly apparently what he needed because he understood what. Uh, I meant that the the kind the Gene Wilder kind of guy that was in the producers and that where he was sort of the you know nervous and uh, I can't do it and 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 fumbly stumbly awkward and and uh, Robert said on the, on that podcast he said at, at the, hearing those two words he said I absolutely knew it was exactly the right thing to say and I thought well okay <laughs> that's what you think but but he did and he pulled it off and in his scenes with Diane. Uh, Diane Chibita, uh, Chibita actually is her name, uh, who uh, who was so they were so perfectly fitting together uh, were some of my favorite scenes in the piece. And he's uh, Rob, Bobby's told me that on when he was out <laughs> doing uh, public appearance tours for Freddy versus Jason a few years ago, they had a lot of those conferences, and and people would always be asking him about Willie. And he said, indeed, more people ask him about Willie than they ask him about Freddy Krueger. And at one point, uh, one of the people that was running the press conference for the studio said, well, okay, we've got, we've got, we've got nice of all of this talk about V is nice, but does anybody have a question that's not about V? And Robert <laughs> said that all their hands came down. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he's even done spoofs on himself uh, uh, doing it. There's a, there's a, I don't know if it was on Comedy Central or, or where years ago, he did a piece where he was trying to impress, bringing a young woman back to his uh, his his room and uh, showing her his trophies and all the Freddy Krueger stuff. And she goes, yeah, but what about Willie? I really want to talk about Willie. <laughs> and he just he erupts, I'm so sick of talking about Willie, my God. <laughs> he's, he's terrific. And um, and if I can ever get the the, uh, the the sequel, what we were trying to do, of course, is make is do a remake of the original miniseries as a theatrical feature uh, to be followed by um, uh, the two sequel movies that I created in my novel, V, The Second Generation, um, where, yes, there you go. Oh, yeah, there you go. And, I told you I did my homework. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. So so that we can uh, really, really do it and do it right. And speaking of books, as a matter of fact, this is my new book. Uh, i got to get a plug in for that. This is Holmes Coming. Get it? Uh, and uh, it's about Sherlock Holmes, the original uh, character that uh, Conan Doyle created. And I thought, wouldn't it be intriguing if he uh, got bored at the end of the 1800s and decided to, uh, because his, his friend H.G. Wells had written The Time Machine, and of course he knows there's no time machines, but he is a master chemist and he thinks, well, what about if I sort of pickle myself and uh, uh, invest so that I can investigate the mysteries of the, of the, the crimes of the future? 
And that's what he does. And he suddenly wakes up in contemporary San Francisco, the same uh, eccentric, egocentric, cocaine addicted, sexist <laughs> genius, you know. But because he's 100 years out of sync, sometimes his brilliant deductions are just a little skewed. And, uh, and his new Dr. Watson is a female, which he doesn't understand. A female doctor. <laughs> Really, you know, and so it's a it's a fun book, and um, uh, and I can recommend it. Uh, we also did an audio uh, uh, edition of it uh, with a wonderful cast, uh, and I had it. I had the recordings arranged so that we could all be live hearing each other at the same time, and I had I had actors spread over five cities and eight time zones, but we were all acting together in the same room, so that it gives it a, the audio version a real extra you know a bit of sparkle. So yeah. Anyway, well, that, Obviously, it seems uh, it seems like a great idea. There's obviously demand for Sherlock stories, and I think that uh, you know there were very different takes recently. You had Elementary with Johnny Lee Miller, and of course, mm -hmm. the the Sherlock with uh, with Benedict Cumberbatch, and very different takes. But in both of those instances, they're contemporary. But he is a modern day Sherlock. The idea that the actual guy, <laughs> you know, basically pops exactly. up. Uh, I think it's a it's a great idea. Oh, thanks, and, um, it's, and it's true because I mean Holmes has literally been done to death over and over again in so many different manifestations and animated and young Sherlock and all of that sort sure. of thing. But but when, what I got from reading the the Doyle stuff was uh, uh, the original character. I said we've never seen him, and it would be fun to see him a fish out of water. I love that kind of story uh, in the contemporary world, and uh, and it's a, it's really sort of a um, uh, a fun mystery comedy romance almost sort of. Uh, as well. So it's a, it's a fun book. Well, uh, I, I uh, don't want to keep you too much longer, but I, I feel like we have to focus on, you know, obviously the, 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 the writing is, is great. You have wonderful casting performances. It won't work if the effects aren't good. And I think <laughs> that's the most important thing is watching it again. The composite shots where the motherships are over the cities. I'm like, how does that still look good 40 years later? Like, you know, before before George Lucas went in and remastered the Star Wars special editions, I remember the effects you started to kind of see like, oh, there's a square around this. Those didn't have it. And by the way, I have the standard de uh, definition. This is the DVD from like 2001. I don't have the Blu-ray. So this isn't even remastered. I don't even have that. And I was just impressed. You know, I I'm not going to lie. There's might be one or two times where you're like, okay, but so much, like 95% of it, I was like, how does it still look this good? Nothing looks this good from 40 years ago, you know? <laughs> well, it's funny because uh, when we were doing it, I was extremely frustrated because, I mean, I was working with the A-Team. I was working with guys that had worked on the Star Wars movies uh, and done matte paintings. Greg Jean, who built the miniatures, uh, built the, the, the mothership from Close Encounters and the Starship Enterprise uh, and his team. Uh, you know, and I, and I had all the top motion control guys in the world and all of that. But but you couldn't move the camera in those days when you were doing a special effect, a visual effects shot. Uh, you couldn't track things in. It wasn't until Jurassic Park uh, that ILM got to the point where you, where you could really move and have a shaky camera and still have the uh, the visual effects working inside it. And and uh, and I mean I, I I look at some of those effects and there were there were a couple of shots uh, in the original V that costs about seventy five thousand dollars for about four seconds of film that you can do better on your cell phone today, you know? <laughs> and, and back then I knew it and it was so frustrating. I, I didn't have the freedom with my camera to, uh, <clears throat> to move it the way that I wanted to because I had to constantly be aware of, you can't, you know, the stuff you couldn't do. And uh, now it's, there's nothing you can't do. I mean, when Jane Badler swallowed the guinea pig, we had to do that live on the set. When it goes down her throat, you know, it's because there's a prosthetic on her uh, appliance on her throat with three air bladders in it that I was controlling off camera. Uh, and she and I practiced swallowing for a while to get it to work. And it's um, and that was one of my my great frustrations about the original, that it just never looked as good as I wanted, nor did it look as, so as, uh, as sound like I wanted uh, when uh, I had been after uh, Warner's for years to do a DVD release, and finally they had a brilliant idea. Why don't we do a DVD release? Uh, that was like 2001. And they said, instantly we looked at it and, and for, in Letterbox, and it looks great. And I said, well, yeah, that's because I framed it in 185 for Letterbox. Uh, because my pilot for The Incredible Hulk and, uh, and another of the later Incredible Hulk movies were released overseas by Universal as foreign theatrical movies. 
became the top grossing movies in Europe when they were released over there back in the 70s. And so I thought that, uh, that that might happen with V, and I wanted to shoot V so that it would be ready for that. Warner's screwed the pooch on so many ways on V. That's a whole other show, guys. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, uh, But uh, they never released it overseas. But when it came to the DVD, it looks great because it was shot in 185. Mm-hmm. And there's been a lot of controversy about some of the fans saying, oh, no, that's well, not, you no, know, it was shot in 185. We protected for television, uh, f- uh, three by four, but we shot it in that. But the other thing was, I said to Universe, to Warners, what are you going to use for soundtrack, guys? And they said, well, your original soundtrack. I said, you mean the one that's in mono? Because <laughs> Warners wouldn't give me the money to dub it in stereo at the time? Because nobody's broadcasting in stereo, Ken. Mm-hmm. I said, no, but they're going to be in about 20 minutes, you boneheads. No, we're not going to give you the money <clears throat> or the time to do it right. I mean, I only had seven days to, to do that. And this was in the days when you're working on a dubbing stage. And if you had 16 different tracks of, uh, of sound of special sound effects, they were all each on a separate machine in the back that were rolling like this. Oh, my God, it was nightmare. So when we were doing um, uh, the, the, D- the DVD, I got them to give me the, enough money to go in and remaster the sound in, uh, f- uh, in five-point stereo surround. Um, and I still had the original uh, or- orchestral scores, which had been recorded in three-stripe stereo. Uh, so we created a whole new uh, special effects tra- soundtrack for it. So the, uh, um, the DVD, and particularly the Blu-ray, look and sound you know, like gangbusters. And uh, it was you, so You fun. mentioned it a moment ago. Uh, Joe Harnell uh, did the music for this. And the reason why I want to spend a moment on him, because one, the music is phenomenal in this, but to me, he composed one of the best pieces of music in the history of television, which is The Lonely Man from the end of The Incredible Hulk. Right. It's just like, it's it's like, it's so sad whenever you hear it. It's like, no, I'll, I'll have to be moving on to the next town now. And you're like, no, but can't you stay a while? No, I can't. And then that music comes and you're like, oh my God, that's got to be so terrible to be David Banner. You well, know? and that's exactly what I wanted. I mean, in, in those days in the 70s, uh, most of the um, television, episodic television shows ended with sort of a rousing kind of or strong a martial kind of theme or something like that. I said, Joe, he's a solo guy walking away. It's got to be you and a solo piano. And I remember sitting on the piano bench beside him uh, Joe used to joke that he, he, he said to me, you know, Kenny, you know just enough about music to be dangerous. <laughs> you know? And because uh, it's true. I mean, we'd be on the scoring stage and he'd have something playing and I'd say, you know, this is a pretty good thing. But, you know, and maybe instead of trombones, we ought to use bongos or something. And um, uh, so I had, I had made him crazy a few times. But so I was sitting on the piano bench beside him while while he was playing the, the, the Lonely Man theme for me. And I remember at one point I said, Joe, what if we changed this one note just to that and and he thought ah, rah, 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 and he did it and it was the right move and uh, uh and it's 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 it was joe is a wonderful uh, an amazing guy he'd been trained by aaron copeland uh, he and bernstein were classmates as a matter of fact wow. uh, with leonard bernstein and um uh and when we were doing v uh gonna do v i said look joe there's one thing i know that i want to do and that is i want to have beethoven's fifth symphony play a role in this. And the reason for that is that in during World War II, when the BBC was going to send a coded message to the resistance in Europe, uh, they would start the broadcast with the first four notes of the Fifth Symphony, which is ba 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 ba, which is short, 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 long, which is Morse code for the letter V. And um, uh, and I said, and so I want to use that. And that's the, the, we hear it the first time when Donovan sees the mothership for the very first time. Uh, and it's aberrated a little bit and it's a minor t- key kind of version of it, but that's what it is, boom, 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 boom. And then I said also, Joe, in the fourth movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, there's this brilliant heroic theme that we could use, that we should use as our hero, heroic theme for the resistance. And it makes its appearance the first time when Ben dies in Faye's car after being shot and Michael Wright is sobbing over him. And then Faye looks up and this French horn comes in with bam, 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 which is pure Beethoven right out of the fourth movement. 
and uh, and that's what Joe took and you know and muscled into the to everything else. Um, and Joe uh, also said, you know, we, he said, uh, and there's lots of other. We've got two more minutes. There's lots of other um, uh, notes about the music. Uh, like the beginning is a tarantella in a 12-8 time signature. And that's like Bernard Herrmann's uh, opening score for um, North by Northwest for Hitchcock. Huh. Uh, and, but Joe added into it, uh, on top of it, this, this, these, uh, these notes for Donovan, uh, which, which were, um, it's, it's the ride to the Valkyrie. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. That was the Donovan signature. And Joe got it from bum, 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 from the right of the Valkyrie. Huh. Uh, and we also tapped into uh, Gustav Holst, the planets. Uh, the first movement is Mars, the bringer of war. And it's in a curious 5 4 signature. Uh, instead of four, uh, mar most marches are in 4 4. One, two, yeah. three, four. But uh, the Mars, the bringer of war, is a five-four. It goes one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> it's awkward. Which and Joe created really a seven-four. Pardon? It, that, that's a really off-putting. Uh, yes, it's a left-footed thing. And, yeah. and and Joe, instead of doing it as a five-four, decided to do it as a seven-four piece. And that's what you hear when the uh, uh, they're beginning to come down on the roof of the UN building. Ba 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 bum. Ba 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 bum. And the interesting uh, thing uh, too uh, is uh, that uh, there's uh, also uh, the the uh, most recognizable piece of music for me as a kid is just the decision to use the Star Wars theme for the marching band, but also <laughs> the fact nice that step. whenever Diana's on screen, it's actually like the the little bit more dangerous part of the score. I'm like, well, it doesn't look like an accident, you know. And uh, but I mean, as a kid, I loved the fact that there's like this shorthand of science fiction in here. Uh, I think it's Donovan's <laughs> son says he doesn't even look like ET or Mr. Spock, right. you know? So it's like, That's right. you know, exactly. there wasn't a lot of like awareness of sci-fi within sci-fi, you know what I mean? So. Right. Well, I, I, it was, yeah, it was so obvious though. And it, it you know, it just made, uh, it made absolute sense that, uh, uh, that it, uh, that it should be that way. And that, that we should comment on, on, on what we were doing. And as a matter of fact, I had originally thought, well, I'll, they said, what March do you, what do you want to have the, the high school band play at the production meeting? And, and I said, well, I don't know, maybe something that John Philip Sousa or something. And Shannon, my assistant, uh, who was Frank Ashmore's wife, incidentally, she said when we were casting, she said, could Frank come in and read for Martin? I said, yeah, for sure. And that's how Frank got the part. Uh, but, uh, but Shannon, when I, when I mentioned John Philip Sousa, she, Shannon said, ought to be Star Wars. And we all laughed. And I said, that's what it'll be. <laughs> and uh, John Williams very kindly uh, let us write him a check for, uh, and I was glad because John needed a little more money, you know, uh, unless his heart. Yeah, well, look, he, he hadn't done the NBC Nightly News theme at that point, you know. No, so that he was wasn't bum, 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 yeah. right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the thing that was really fun about it was we, what you hear on the track is the actual high school band playing. And oh, if, that's you've heard, great. if you've heard my commentary, you've heard me say that when we were on the scoring stage, uh, you know, we'd done all the big pieces that we had to do. And then they said, okay, now we got to do Star Wars. And I said, what do you mean you got to do Star Wars? We, we have to record it. We can't use that one from the high school. I said, yeah, yeah, we can. They said, no, no. The musicians union says we have to record it. I said, okay, we'll record it. <laughs> and we recorded it and put it on the shelf and never used it. And I goes, cause, cause they tried and I told them what I wanted them to do. I said, you got to play really badly and bless their hearts. They couldn't play badly enough. <laughs> you know? And uh, so that's how star Wars ended up in the movie. And it was the right one and still is as far as I'm concerned. It's a nice touch. Yeah. Um, so there, there have been many, Alien invasion movies, many of which had blockbuster budgets, and uh, I, I really just don't think any of them hits as hard or holds up as well as V. And I attribute that to the the human element and the fascism theme. Uh, I mean, there's elements in there that are just substantially creepier to me now than they ever were, like the vilification of scientists and um, the idea that whoever controls broadcasting controls the messaging. I I, I wonder if, how have you thought of this in recent years <laughs> it's it's uh um it's always been rewarding because the uh uh 
we we hit a mark that uh, that you rarely get to hit. You, it's so rarely that so rare that one is able to get that kind of lightning in a bottle happening, where you get the combination of the cast and the crew and the execution, with the exception of the uh, uh, visual effects, uh, that are as close to being right as they could possibly be. Um, and uh, it's partly, I think, because I'm, so, I'm something of a, of a perfectionist. At the same time, I always e e e eager to have everybody come and give me their ideas. When I get a cast or crew together, uh, when, if they haven't worked with me before, or even if they have, I remind them on the first day that we are, we are here to, uh, uh, to do two things. We're here to make the most artistic piece we can possibly make, given the time and money we've been given. And we're also here to have a good time. And uh, uh, and I think that's part of uh, what ha has made it come together because that that cast and crew came together so tightly and so brilliantly and so lovingly. Uh, and the the human element, as you said, that's the key thing that really makes it sustain as as it has, and that makes it timeless. I mean, it's basically I've always said it's like Spartacus and the revolt of the slaves. You know, it's about the American Revolution. It's it's the same. Uh, whether whatever whenever you've got a, a a people that is oppressed by an outside power more powerful force and there's resistance against it uh you know that's just such a classic thing and it's and it's made v not only timeless but uh in its own way but but also timely. I mean, there were so many uh, magazine articles and billboards and things depicting uh, what looked like V, but with Donald Trump's face as the leader, you know, uh, which uh, which uh, really sort of got to where we are now, and when we are in a in a in a situation now where anti-Semitism is so rife and on the rise in this country and around the world. Uh, and that's what I was trying to, I wanted the piece to be thought provoking. I wanted people who watched it to say, okay, which one of these characters would I be? You know, would I be her or I'd like to be her or, oh my gosh, I might be her, but uh, that makes me nervous. And, uh, uh, and I think that, that that's part of the, the appeal of it. Um, and, and the fact that it's just, uh, in spite of other people trying to reimagine it, uh, it's a dangerous word, reimagine, um, that it is the original four hours, which is all I really comf am comfortable taking credit for, because those are the only pieces that I was there in intimately involved with from beginning to end and able to uh, try to keep the compass pointed in the right direction and make sure that the fleet was sailing in the right direction uh, and make sure that all of the elements came together as best as they possibly could. Um, that's why, for me, it's the piece that I'm the most proud of. Uh, and because of the way that it's, I mean, uh, certainly the Bionic Woman has is, is become iconic, and the Hulk has become iconic. Even the Joe's theme music for the Hulk has become iconic. And, uh, but, and, and, and V, in its own way, though, has sort of stood out by itself uh, in a way that, uh, you know, makes me extraordinarily proud and grateful to the audience's who have received it so um, so lovingly all these years. Yeah, uh, Kenny, before we wind things down, I did want to talk just briefly. I know you've talked about it before. Uh, was was your intention, obviously, this is set up so clearly that there's going to be the follow-up. And I know that to some extent you're involved in the follow-up miniseries, but uh, then you took your game off of it. Uh, at, at how far along in that process did you get? Was it pretty quickly? You're like, this isn't this isn't what I signed no, up for. No, 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 no. What happened? What happened was um, um, uh, when when the, we 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 saw the Brandon the ratings and the the enormous audience response and everything really made Brandon convinced that it should go to series. We couldn't afford to do a one hour episodic series. Uh, because it was just too expensive at that time to try to to try to do this kind of a show. Um, the the original mini the original miniseries went over budget by two or three million dollars. But I later discovered why. <laughs> it had nothing to do with me because I was on schedule as a director. We finished the show on schedule, uh, 
Um, uh, but yet I, they kept saying, well, it's going up a million. The budget went up a million dollars this week. I said, why? <laughs> you know, I this you had the budget ahead of time. This is what we were going to do. The problem is Warner's never budgeted it right to begin with. And uh, and it was just, you know, it was really a mess. And also I discovered that I that V was the only thing shooting on the Warner's lot at the time. And I thought, well, that's good. That means they'll be focused on paying me attention to getting this done right. No, no, no. What that meant was that every department that had a little overage in their budget somewhere could dump it onto the onto the V budget. And that's what the production department was doing. They were we bought I bought more carpet for executives' offices and fuel for the Warner Brothers jet than anything else. And it was it was infuriating. But the bottom line was they couldn't afford to do it as an episodic series. And uh, and Brandon said, I just wanted, how about a, a six hour mini, six hour sequel miniseries? Warner said, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, we don't want to be in the miniseries business. And Brandon came back and said, how about this? We'll let you do the six hour miniseries sequel. And what we will give Warners and Kenny is a blind on the air commitment to a series of something else entirely that Kenny creates. And Warner said, sure, okay. And I said, yeah, fine, whatever. Just let me get onto the set and <laughs> do my work on V. Um, and I hired uh, three writers that had been protégés and brilliant in their own right, Craig Buck, Peggy Goldman, and Diane Froloff, who had written for me on other projects and the Hulk and everything, uh, to come on board and, uh, and help me create the six hour sequel. And we spent the summer of 83 doing exactly that. Uh, and we created a script that in many ways was better than what I had written initially. Well, partly because there were three more really good minds going, you know, uh, and, and it was, uh, it was really, we were really proud of the screenplay that we'd written. Uh, and then shortly before we were start to start production, uh, I got a call to come meet with Barry Meyer, who was then the head of business affairs at uh, uh, Warner's TV. And, uh, and Barry said, look, um, we really don't want you to direct any of the sequel. I said, well, you see, that's in my, in my contract, you know? And he said, yeah, I know. Well, forget that. I mean, it was like, literally forget the contract. Uh, we don't want you to do it. I said, why is that? And he said, well, we're afraid you won't two things. He said, we're afraid you won't do it as quick and cheap and dirty as we want to get it done to get it over with literally those words. And also, wow. We were really anxious for you to get started creating that series that Warren, that NBC is going to do. And I said, no, uh, I'm out of here. He said, well, what do you mean? You have a contract. I said, you just breached the contract. That's history, Barry. You know? and, uh, and, um, uh, and he said, well, you can't take that, that, that series commitment from NBC and take it to another studio. I said, I know. And he said, but... But that's but that, that that's crazy. You'll be you're taking a million or two or three million dollars out of your pocket. And I said, sorry, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. But that's but uh, that's and and they would not back down, and they were just con, you know content to go forward and steam ahead. We had a I said a very nice settlement as I left the studio, but I was crushed because I didn't want my baby to be handed off to parents that I foster parents that I didn't trust. But I, you know, there was nothing I could do. I mean, Warners had just screwed the pooch. It's so interesting you put it that way because uh, someone asked uh, George Lucas what he thought of Star Wars Episode Seven, the J.J. Abrams one, and he said it's like, oh, it, it's like watching your ex-wife with someone else. It's like you can kind of see some things, but it's nothing like the way you remember it. And you know, I think that was kind of a diplomatic way. And look, he did fine for himself. You know, he sold it to Disney. He knew what he did, but at the same time, that I was. That's the main thing that I've been wondering. Were you able to watch what followed or have have you in the years since watched or are you just like, I'm not interested? No, what happened was when they when the uh, first of all, I had to Faye and Mark were both crushed and wanted off and get and wanted to get out. So did Jane uh, and didn't want to be involved in the sequel at all. Uh, they were under contract and uh, and they were stuck and they couldn't. And it was painful when I had to tell them that I wasn't going to do it, but they understood Sure, uh, sure. Why and my reasoning, uh, but I also then heard from them as the the it started going forward and the new team came in and started rewriting the script which NBC had loved, and now NBC was going oh my God what is the but it's too late we're already committed we're out of you know, uh, and um, they had to go forward, and all of my friends who worked on it both cast and crew uh, told me don't ever look at it Kenny because it will 
tear your heart out. It's just, it's really, don't go there. And it got very nice numbers and uh, not nearly as what we had on the original. Uh, the reviews were, <laughs> were a different story. Uh, and, um, and I did take my name off of it. Uh, Lillian Weezer is yeah, my, <laughs> was my golden retriever. Yeah, she has her own IMDb page, though. Yeah, she's Lillian Weezer. Uh, and because I just didn't want to have my name on it. And, um, uh, and, I, and I never saw any of it. Uh, any of the stuff that followed, um, except a, a, a small piece of, um, I was channel surfing one day. And the scene came up and I went, what is that? And it was Jane playing a scene with, uh, and I said, oh my God, this is the priest with the priest. Now we had written the script, uh, 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 the character of this priest into our script. But he was a, uh, he was like, do you remember the scrappy priest in The Exorcist, the, 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 the Father oh, Karras, yeah. you know, who was the young, you know, streetsy priest, right? That's the character we wrote. And, uh, and he had given Diana a Bible, and she had read the Bible, and in this scene that we wrote, uh, she, was, she was distraught. She was uh, something we've never seen from from. Diana, she was troubled. She was, I, I, it, it stirred up things. I read your Bible and it stirred up these feelings in me. And, uh, and they, and they, and, and I don't know quite how to handle them except this way. And she turns around and shoots him in the head. And it was a stunning scene because you never saw it coming. And, uh, and that's what we had written. That's not the way, uh, what I was seeing on the screen was, first of all, they cast. An old Irish guy like Barry Sullivan, you know, well, Diana, darling, did you read your Bible? I gave you, you know, and Diane and the priest is like back here and Diana is in the close foreground and she's going, yes, priest, I read your Bible. And, you know, it's like, oh, my God. And I watched them in 30 seconds make every wrong, every mistake you could make in 30 seconds. And that's when I decided for sure I can never go back and look at that. And uh, and it's disappointing. And I and I know that the, the there were a lot of fans from it, and there were fans for the later series uh, that was done with Faye and Mark, and uh, and then for the two thousand eight two thousand nine uh, oh, see attempt. Um, they uh, it, it has its fans too. But uh, and I looked at uh, just a little piece of it once and said no 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 no. no going to step away. And Mark uh, and I had had lunch uh, one morning or breakfast one time after he had gone and done the final episode of that 2009. And he said, Kenny, he said, first of all, they were really scared of me. He said, <laughs> him, Mark, you know, and uh, because I knew better. And he said, and they were doing everything wrong but they were doing it badly, you know, and uh, and he said, and and uh, and also one of the uh, executive producers, I think the first one who uh, Warner's had brought in, who had gotten fired off of it, later told me, oh my God, the whole thing was a disaster from the beginning to end, and uh, uh, and it was, you know, it was disappointing to hear. But I, in the meantime, had written V, the Second Generation, which picked up the story twenty years later. That one, yes. Uh, and told the story that I wanted to tell. We were going to do it as a mini. I, uh, I came up with the idea, and, and after dub, I came up with the idea while I was dubbing the, uh, the the stereo dub for the DVD. And Dave West, we got to the ending scene where Faye sent the message into deep space, and Dave stopped the sc the film from running and turned around and looked at me and said, "So what happened?" And I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, what happened?" I want to know what happened. And I thought, yeah, there's an idea, <laughs> you know. And I went to Major Warners uh, because they own the TV rights. Uh, I own, it turns out, all the other rights. Uh, and they own the TV rights. And um, uh, and I said, here, here's what I'd like to do. V, the second generation, picks up the story 20 years later. We Some of our original characters are in it, some of the principals. Uh, some of them have changed in ways we would not have expected. And uh, and and they, they, the Warners loved it. We went to NBC. We sold it to NBC. But it, Brandon wasn't there this time. Yeah. And, and it was like uh, the, the executives from hell uh, who just didn't understand it, didn't get it. It worked on it. But finally said, OK, OK, we'll do it. We'll do it as a four hour. <clears throat> but then they had two really bad experiences in a row. They did a miniseries called The Warsaw Ghetto. Now, there's a cheerful uh, <laughs> A tune in yeah. factor, right? That, and, that, 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 already, that already doesn't seem like four quadrants, Kenny. No, no, right. It's definitely not. That's made barely half a quadrant. And then they did 
that they spent a gazillion dollars doing a mini series of wait for it hercules oh, it's yeah. like the, about the 400th edition that anybody ever done of hercules which apparently was also a uh, rather a mess and at that point nbc decided that they didn't want to do any more miniseries and i said but wait <laughs> you know we've got the oh no no we don't no more miniseries we're, we're out of the miniseries business and at almost the same time abc and cbs decided to get out of the long form business as well so mm -hmm. you know it was frustrating but uh, at least the novel got made and my hope is that uh, sooner or later we will uh, finally <laughs> we've made three deals on getting the trilogy made the motion picture trilogy made one oh. with this chinese money one with indian money and one with this uh, pharmaceutical billionaire named Charles Hinsley, who uh, who bought the title, the name of Desilu Studios, and we were going to do it through them. V, we wanted to be their big flagship project, and we even got a nice chunk of money for an option so that we could start prepping and start location scouting and visual effects work. Uh, and then the Hollywood Reporter did this big expose that Mr. Hinsley was a sham. <laughs> <laughs> that all of the money that was coming in for to for his company that didn't really exist uh, was being brought in because they wanted to be on board with V, something V was involved with, and uh, and he's uh, now facing some serious legal trouble. Uh, oh. And uh, <clears throat> but uh, but uh, we have not given up, and uh, uh, we know there's an audience for it. Uh, Mark and I were at uh, at, at Comic Con. Uh, in 2019 when we released the blu-ray and you know you walk into a room with 3,000 people standing on their chairs because they love your stuff uh it's it's so wonderful and to be also to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with the fans uh which i also have via email because i write back to all the people that write to me and um uh and and it's it's wonderful to hear what they think and what they like and i know I know from everything that I hear uh, that uh, that there's an audience. If we put it up, they will come. Yeah, the one thing that I'll say that can be taken away from the the reboot, if you will, from 2009 is the quality it was not there, except I think it was cast really well and they were able to have obviously some decent effects. This, the basic part of the story, you know, the one or two sentence log line, that still worked. My wife was born in 1983. So she had never seen it. And so we watched it week to week. The one, only thing that I'll say that they did right, because they had a series order, they could very gradually start to realize, like you didn't see a, a, a lizard face until like the third episode or something, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that the interest, the demand, it, I think it got picked up for a second season, but it, the ratings yeah, were well, it got yeah. picked up. It got picked up for, you know, they only ended up doing like six or seven shows in the first season or maybe eight. Right. Yeah. And it only got picked up for a second season. But when the pilot got written, I, everybody at ABC told me, or was it ABC? No, it was, in, you know, it was, it was, a, it was ABC. It was yeah, ABC, yeah. yeah. Everybody at ABC told me it's never going to get bought. It's never going to go to, never going to go to pilot. Then the pilot got made and they said, well, the pilot got made, but it's never going to go to series. And then they went to series. Uh, and then, then, then when it did so badly, uh, they said, well, it'll never get picked up because nothing else that ABC put on that year got picked up. And the only thing that had that had any kind of a name to it was V, even though it had been a disaster. Yeah. They picked it up for uh, another few episodes, and uh, you know, and they they just uh, they just missed. And then, and then it it ended very abruptly. That series, uh, you know, yeah. I, I yeah, I watched it. I I I thought it more or less fl fell flat for most of it. The last episode was highly entertaining because it really had that factor of the showrunners knowing that it's over. So they just said, screw it. And he threw a lot of things at you. Yeah, <laughs> having Mark, they had brought Jane back for a couple episodes yeah. as like the mother of the, you know, so it was like, I mean, that's that you had me watching it because I'm like, oh my God, I haven't seen Jen Badler. And that's one of the things when we were talking about her, how she didn't do more, uh, you know, and not that she didn't do anything in her career, but I was just like, how, you know, every time I watch this, I'm like, she's so great. How does everybody not see this? And, you know, I, th I think that like the most high profile thing, I think she did like a, uh, like a, a, a revival of Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's where she met her husband in Melbourne and, uh, and that's where she lives. And, uh, oh, okay. uh, and they, you know, she made a home and she became a singer and did, you know, stuff like that over there. Mark, uh, you know, still works. And, um, uh, <laughs> he wrote me just the other day. He said, I'm going to, uh, uh, London for the Comic Con uh, in March. He said, "I it's they they want me to over there because of some show that I did in the past. I think it was called Five, 
And <laughs> he said, uh, oh, you mean Roman numeral V? Yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, he's so, so he's done okay. Faye uh, went on to Broadway. Uh, I was at the premiere of Singing in the Rain, in Singing in the Rain where uh, she had gone in to audition for the Debbie Reynolds role and her voice broke in the middle of it. And she started to walk off the stage and, and Twyla Tharp said, wait, 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 would you read for the other role? The Gene Hag, the Gene Hag, you know, I can't stand him. And Faye played that role on Broadway. I can't stand him. You know, the blonde that was yeah, the yeah. bimbo. And, uh, and I was at the premiere when it, when it opened on Broadway and, uh, and she got more applause than anybody else that night. <laughs> something. And, uh, uh, she lives now in the Carolinas and uh, and teaches acting, but uh, doesn't want to want to do it do anymore. But uh, uh, but no, there were uh, uh, there were so many so many friends that are that are still together yeah, yeah. and fond of each other today, and we stay in touch. I'm going to ask you two more things, and I'll finally let you go. You've been so generous with your time. Uh, there are variations on the same theme. Now, I don't know where the legality and the ownership lies in this specific question. But uh, what I do know is that in recent years, there have been releases of uh, Harlan Ellison wrote City on the Edge of Forever, the Star Trek episode, and he hated the way it turned out because it was so different from his script. Well, they eventually took his original script and adapted it into a comic book. They adapted mm -hmm. the first draft of George Lucas's script, which is called The Star Wars. It's very different. They turned <laughs> that into a comic book. Is your, your script for the second miniseries something that could be purchased and could be adapted or is it too tied up because of uh you know basically what happened warner is it something that could come out at some point to see what your original vision could, was because it, it absolutely could because it, it uh, um the comic books that you read uh that you showed me earlier on about v uh yeah warner's uh, I, I got a check one day from universal from warner's and i said what's this check for and they said oh that's your royalty from the publishing of uh, the stuff of v and i said um, guys, we never negotiated for that. And I got separated rights because I was the sole writer on the piece. Right. And there was a big, there was a big oops going on. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and that was, uh, uh, you know, that was uh, part of the oops that uh, they, 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 and then it, it, it really came full circle when I, uh, and, and we went around and around about it for years back in the eighties. Uh, but then I just sort of set it aside and figured, okay, well, maybe they got a piece of that, but uh, you know, uh, but then one day, uh, a few years back, I got a call from Warner's Theatrical Business Affairs asking if I'd be interested in selling them the rights to V. And I said, um, wait a minute, what? <laughs> you know? And uh, they said, well, you own the right. And, and uh, uh, I got on the phone with Dan Fury, who was then the, uh, the head of uh, Warner Legal Business Affairs. And he said, you had separated rights, Kenny. You own the rights to V. Everything you own, everything except TV rights. You know, you can't go and make a new TV show. Wow. Uh, that's why. That's why I, uh, uh, when I came up with the idea of the second generation, I went back to Warner's because, uh, uh, you know, I said, uh, I, "You own the TV rights," and they were happy. They were excited to have me come back. I'd already since then, since V had done a a, a, a television series for them, a pilot in a series called Shadow Chasers back in '86, I think it was, which was which was um, uh, the X file, the X Files with a sense of humor before there was an X-Files, you know, and uh, it was very clever, but uh, they put us on opposite Cosby and Magnum, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's like, you know, it speaks yeah. to a graveyard time period. Uh, but, oh, I know one thing that I had wanted to say was the, um, um, when the Bionic Woman was gonna go on the air, uh, Peter Roth, who was head of Warner's TV at the time, uh, told me that it was gonna be the sensation of the year. It was gonna be the big hit of the year. It was gonna, uh, it was gonna have enormous, it was tracking, you know, they track these things. It was tracking off through the roof. It was gonna be the biggest hit series in the history of Western civilization, you know. And I said, have you seen it, Peter? You seen the pilot? And he said, no, it doesn't matter. The numbers are great. I said, Peter, I've seen the pilot. It doesn't work. It's not gonna succeed. So what are you talking about? It's the bionic woman. I said, oh, it's not the bionic woman, not the one that people remember. It, you know, they, they, it doesn't have any of the heart or the humanity or the humor. And it certainly does not have Lindsay Wagner. And it's going to, you know, now it opened big, uh, 14, 15 million people, which is a huge hit nowadays. But the second week, it dropped like 30%. The third week, another 30%. And after five, six weeks, it was canceled. And almost exactly the same pattern happened when they tried to put V on the air as a as in 2009. A big tune in that first time, which shows you what? Well, there's an audience that wants to see more of V 
but they all said, oh, but not that V. And the writing, <laughs> the ratings dropped off 30%, and then another 30%. And and then they took it off the air and put it back on uh, with the, the lead-in of Lost right before it, which was their biggest right. show. <clears throat> and the ratings were went down even further. <laughs> you know, so they just uh, they just missed it, you know, and it's uh, yeah, it's, uh, right. And you're you're talking about the the revival of Bionic Woman that I think it was one of the producers of Battlestar Galactica. I forget that. Oh I yeah, exactly. oh, and da oh, David Ike, David Ike. I don't know him personally, but I, he, I he's a stand-up guy in my book because after the show crashed and burned, I saw him in an interview or heard him in an interview talking about how we didn't get it. He said we blew it. We never understood what the show was about. He said, we, and it didn't really have any humanity or heart or, hum I mean, it, it was like exactly the words that I had told Peter a year before. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and for him to be able to stand up and say that, I thought, okay, he's a, he's a stand up guy in my book. So uh, it seems like I already have the answer to my last question, which is that it, you're able to, uh, you know, the, the revival, we're now like a decade removed from that a little bit more. So that, you know, maybe slowed down, I'm talking about uh, for V, the ABC series, mm -hmm. you know, that probably would have cooled interest for at least a little while. But now I feel like, especially this being the 40th anniversary, you probably have got a lot of people like me reaching out to you who want to talk about it. Uh, so this could be the gr a great time for you to try and move forward with whatever, whatever is next. Uh, is, well, is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. And it has, and we've known it for, for the last uh, three or four years as uh, my producing partner, John Hermanson is, uh, is currently, uh, you know, we've, as I said, we had it. We literally had it set up three times, and then then there was no ink in the pen or no money in their bank when they said there was. You know, yeah. uh, in spite of the fact that we'd seen all of these uh, reports of uh, proof of funds, it was very frustrating. So yes, uh, it's something that absolutely could happen. The the remake is a remake. It is a faithful remake of what the original miniseries was. Uh, they are the same characters for the most part, uh, and uh, and. Um, and I, because one of the things that you learn from listening to reading the emails and standing in front of the audiences in Comic-Con is I know what they want. What they want is what I gave them originally, but just brought up into the 21st century. And uh, because there were no cell phones when I did this, you know, <laughs> there was so much. It wasn't just the special effects that were lagging behind. It was there's, there's a whole new and there wasn't social media and there wasn't all of that sort of stuff going on, which are all which all factor into uh, the script for the uh, for the remake. Uh, plus, uh, you know, a few surprises. Uh, but at the same time, um, it's uh, uh, the story, the, the essential emotional story is the same. And I know that that's what they want, and that's what the remake will set up and lead into the uh, the second generation that picks up the story twenty years later. And uh, um, and we're you know I'm ready to go, guys. You know uh, it's been it's been forty years since I've been on the set doing V, and it's way do way overdue as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so for people to keep in touch with you, I think uh, your website is just kennethjohnson.com. Is that correct? No, kennethjohnson.us. That's why I asked. Okay. That's so. right. Yeah. And, uh, and my, I'm, I'm on Facebook. I'm, I'm Kenneth Johnson author because that's what I do now. You know, this, this yeah, kind of please, stuff. yeah, I was going to ask you to, what is it? Holmes coming? coming? It's Holmes that, coming. Holmes coming. coming. Yes. And yeah. And I, I've, I've had, uh, after I did V, uh, the V book, I thought, okay, well, at least I can have some fun doing this sometimes. And I, I, I wrote one in, uh, in 2017 called the man of legends, not an autobiography, <laughs> uh, but uh, rather a supernatural thriller uh, that was became a an instant bestseller on Amazon and uh, ended up really remaining as a bestseller for a long time. And it's uh, it's still out there, plus a couple of other novels since then. If people go to Amazon and and, and look for me, they'll find it. Uh, but there's there's stuff that I'm proud of, and uh, uh, and I hope to keep doing some. But I'd much rather I'm a director, guys. You know, I, as I said, I only started writing because uh, I discovered that actors could do bit parts and work their way up and writers could write on spec and hopefully somebody would buy, buy your movie like Chris Nolan said. Uh, and if you're lucky, then maybe they might let you direct. And when uh, uh, Harv Bennett asked me to write The Bionic Woman and hit it off with me and wanted me to become a producer writer for Six Million Dollar Man, I said, how about I just write and direct for you, Harv? And Harv said, no, Kenny, listen, let me explain television. In television, it's the producer that controls the medium. The producer gets to hire the writer, 
and hired the director. And I said, okay, I got it. I'll take that job. And, uh, and so I was able to get my foot in the door as a writer. My pal Bochco helped me make that connection to begin with and Steve Cannell as well. Uh, and then once I was doing that, I could hire myself to direct. The problem then became finding time to do so because when you're executive producing a series, you got to be sure the fleet is sailing in the right direction. You don't have to, time to be down in the, within the bridge on the bridge with a captain, you know, you know, shooting down the planes. And uh, uh, but uh, but directing is what I love the most, and uh, uh, and I love being with my cast and crew. And it's um, uh, it's the Susie, my wife. Uh, said, next time I go out to direct something, she's going to needlepoint a little thing to sign to hang on my director's chair that just says DNR, or do not <laughs> resuscitate. You know, if he dies here, that's what he would have liked to do. And, uh, and that's still how I feel. And I still have the energy to do it. Well, uh, as he said, KennethJohnson.us and uh, Holmes coming. Uh, we really appreciate you giving so much of our time and uh, hopefully it inspires more people to uh, go and uh, check out various iterations of how you can watch this. Uh, this, right. you know, get the, get the Blu-ray. Uh, it's apparently fancier than what I have. I, I'm intrigued now. I'm going to have to check it out myself. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ChristianDMZ. Please subscribe to uh, all of our shows over here on the Geekscape Network, including the show that I host, the Geekscape Book Club, uh, which will be back at the end of the month uh, talking about a uh, Kang the Conqueror series, which actually caught my eye. It's right here. So uh, you can find us on the Geekscape Book Club over there. Uh, John Pett, thank you for joining us. Where can people find you and keep in touch with you? Uh, Twitter as well, John Pett, uh, J-O-H-N-P-E-T-T-E. Well, uh, thank you both. This is a lovely uh, conversation. It's uh, always fun to uh, revisit this world that you created, Kenny. And uh, oh, well, thank thanks. you for it. And thanks thank you so for much. And John, thanks thanks to you both, you, John and Christian, for uh, for your sincere and deep interest. And uh, it's uh, it's fun for me to talk about. You know, when you're doing something you love, uh, it's fun to talk about it. And, you know, one of the things I love is getting to talk to people about stuff like this. So uh, it really was a thrill. And uh, don't don't ex don't be surprised, Kenny, if you get a follow up email from me in a few weeks about like, <laughs> so now can we talk about Incredible Hulk for an hour and 45 minutes? <laughs> oh, my God. As well. so, I'll be but, around. I'll be here and standing by. And, and thanks again for your for your interest, guys. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks again, Thank uh, Kenny Johnson. And yep. uh, thanks to all of you. We'll uh, see you next time.